Other questions? So, I mean, I wasn't really aware of what you just sort of said that most people don't watch movies because I've probably watched so many movies and just think it's commonplace. Um, so, is that why we sort of consider, because we were talking slightly earlier, that different levels of abstraction of celebrity are respected more, like reality TV probably lower than, uh, you know, a sure. cover batch, than a theater actor, than like a novelist? Than like Yes, that's exactly why, because you see, the, the less sophisticated the genre, the more the genre is like real life. And the more sophisticated it is, the more it has abstracted out across instances of real life the fundamental lessons. And that's what makes something profound and deep. It's abstracted from multiple sources and it applies across multiple dimensions. Because that's what you want. It's like, and here's why, fundamentally. It's like, there are, you have a problem. But that's not the problem. The problem is that there are problems. So the problem is a meta problem. There are problems. You need a solution to that. That's not a solution to a problem. That's a meta solution to the class of problems. Right. Right, and that's what people have been trying to figure out ever since we were able to actually figure things out. It's not how do you solve a problem, it's how do you act so that you solve the problem of problems. And that's basically at least the complexity of life and the fact that you're mortal and vulnerable. So, so then a, a follow up question uh, from your book you have this sort of strata from play all the way up to religion and, the, and beyond that, sort of looking back yep. retroactively with philosophy and rationality. Yes. Is, is, well, that's, that's a good one. It's a good, I would say that the best way, if you really want to think this through, the best way to do that is to read Nietzsche and Dostoevsky at the same time. Now, I'm sure there's other ways of doing this, but Nietzsche was actually quite heavily influenced by Dostoevsky, more than people knew, although their thought runs very parallel. And so, Dostoevsky is like the ultimate dramatist, right? He embodies his ideas and he has them act out in a dramatic space, it's literary. Whereas Nietzsche has taken that up one level of abstraction to the semantic. He says, well, here's what's going on in an articulated way, but he doesn't embody it in the story. And you might say, well, that's, that's higher, but it, it's only higher in a way. It's more abstract in that it's more like words, whereas what Dostoevsky does is half words and half images, right? Because when you read a novel, what happens is that people say, and the postmodernists say, well, where the hell is the meaning in that novel? It's like, it's not in the word, it's not in the phrase, it's not in the sentence, it's not in the paragraph, you know, where do you localize the meaning? It's a great question. Their answer sucks, but the question's great. So, but what happens partly when you're reading a book is that a novel is that the words trigger representations in your imagination and a lot of the information from which a lot of what you extract the information from is actually your imagistic representation of the words and that imagistic representation is richer than the words because it's informed by all of your knowledge about people and so you, you know this happens because you go to a movie like the Harry Potter movies and you say that's not how I imagined it Right, the probability that there'll be a one-to-one -one correspondence between your internal representation of the book and the movie is zero. And usually the movie is less rich than the book. I mean, I love movies and, and they have their own place, that's for sure, but... They're, well, many series, the series now are, are more approaching the complexity and depth of literature because they can extend across 20 hours. You know, and, you know, they don't have to compress a 12-hour reading experience into two hours of action. So, yeah, and so what I was trying to do with that hierarchy was to show how the knowledge moved. Like, first of all, it's kind of implicit in your biology, and then it's distributed into society. And then by imitating society, you make it part of your procedures, and then you watch your own procedures and start to build a representation of them, and then you can articulate that representation. And it's a, it's a bootstrapping process, too, because once you've made the representation, that can affect the way you behave, and so they start to loop. And so, like, so here's one one idea. So imagine that. Imagine that there's a, a type of 
male who tends to win dominance hierarchy contests and to merge at the top well that's the case, that is the case, and that's why you're the way you are and so what's happened among human beings, this is so cool, is that human females are choosy maters so about twice as many men, men fail in their reproductive efforts as females fail okay, but the men who succeed are more successful so women are on average more successful and men are on average more failures and more successful and, and I'm talking strictly about reproduction here, although it generalizes to other areas but I'm talking about reproduction so how does it work exactly? well the women have a real, real problem with mate selection, it's like who the hell are you going to have as a mate? and it's too complex to work out, so women in their genius don't, they let the men compete and then they peel from the top acting out the assumption that the man who wins is the best man, and it's a good assumption, because if you have a bunch of men competing, especially if they're competing across competitions and someone pops up at the top you can think, well they may not be worth much, but they're better than anyone else at whatever it is that they're doing and that makes men at the top of dominance hierarchies very attractive to women and then the women accelerate that, so you can imagine they're more likely to reproduce and so what happens is that the proclivity to emerge at the top of the set of dominance hierarchies becomes inbuilt into the biology across time and the women exaggerate that by differentially allowing the men to reproduce and that's also why they're mother nature they really are mother nature, There's, it's, it's not just a metaphor and so then the representation and the biology start to tangle together and that's like, well that's the difference between a meme and an archetype right, a meme is this idea that propagates itself but an archetype is an idea that has propagated itself across such a massive span of time that it's actually shaped the course of evolution itself and men, you, I, I can tell you already how this in, it isn't necessarily that you even have to compete with other men in order to see who wins as soon as you admire someone and that'll happen unconsciously, you won't, you won't be able to stop yourself you've already elevated them in the dominance hierarchy contest the act of admiration is your recognition that you've met someone who's better at whatever it is that happens to be driving your admiration than you are and so, and that's part, that's partly the manifestation of just the idea as the, as the, uh, what would you say, as the representation of, as, of the ideal and kids do that all the time, they hero worship other kids, usually like a four year old will latch on to some six year old who will just follow or she'll follow everywhere and do exactly what they do and it's like, well, why? well, because that person reps, represents to that child their next ideal, their, their conceptualization of the, of, the, of the place forward so, so okay, and, and any other questions or, or should we maybe call it a day?